Are we recording? Yep. It didn't count down all the way. Five, four, three, two, one. Because it doesn't like you. That's true. You know who else doesn't like me? Hmm. The doctor's office. Thanks for queuing me up. I appreciate that. <laughs> I'm I'm really working on my stand up presence, and you're just allowing me to like effortlessly transfer between topics so i'm at the doctor's office who's who here has been to the doctor recently okay this is where you go woo. oh woo. <laughs> thank you thank you i appreciate that naomi so i'm at the doctor's office earlier naomi yeah. and i think they forgot about me because my appointment was at 11 20 a.m and i got there at 11 05 and I had to wait like 35 minutes in the waiting room. And then they were like, Joel, it's your turn. And I'm like, oh boy. And the lady's leading me back. And she's like, can you confirm your date of birth? And I'm like, gave her my date of birth. Um, and she leads me into a room and she's like, the doctor will be right with you. Well, 12 o'clock rolls around. No doctor. 1210 rolls around. No doctor. 1215 i'm beginning to be convinced that it's like an elaborate escape room or some kind of research trial where they're studying my patients which is not related to why i was at the doctor's office uh, but eventually he does come in and i'm in and out within the space of about three minutes so i don't know if my my escape room time elapsed or they just decided they were done fucking with me or maybe someone was like by the way joel's been in there a long time and the doctor's like wait joel oh shit i hate that guy I should go do something. It's like that one episode of Seinfeld where his dad goes to the back doctor because he's having really bad issues. So he goes to the special back doctor that Seinfeld like hooks him up with. And yeah. he goes in and the doctor forgets about him. And then he goes and gets his x-rays done and comes back and he can't find his wallet. And he's convinced that the doctor stole his wallet. And so later they're out at dinner and Seinfeld had to pay because his dad didn't have a wallet. <laughs> mm-hmm. Anyways, the reason I bring that up is um, don't ever try to get your height increased, Naomi. I know you've been asking for years, and I was thinking maybe yeah. I could get a good six inches if I asked nicely. Yeah. And that, no, they just mess around. They don't even want to like like take you seriously. They stick you in a holding cell until your desire for a consult's gone away, and uh, then they usher you out. That's a smart business model, honestly. Mm-hmm. Do you still have to pay? Um, I don't want to talk about it. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. You know, they say they, they say that, that medical trauma is on the rise, and a big part of that is sticker shock when you get to the cash register at the front. Welcome back to Why Would No One Date These Guys, or better yet, Why Would No One Date This Guy. It's Naomi. Joel I'm is Naomi guy. happy and committed. Yep. In a holding cell. <laughs> In a holding cell. Yeah, they, they don't call it the old ball and chain for nothing. I can't move. It's a 50 pound weight. This week we are starting on um, part 65 of uh, Joel's 178 page outline of uh, why women deserve less and um god forbid we will have six parts we will have six parts of this freaking chapter so uh joel take it away uh before we started naomi i did just want to uh sample americana vintage delicious huckleberry soda um it is this lovely lavender color i have yet to taste it and I'm going to sip on it now, and you will never know the delicious taste I'm about to consume, because you're living in a separate state. Okay. Kind of like Gatorade. Ew. <laughs> I don't know, vintage Huckleberry tasted like electrolyte infused Gatorade. It's refreshing. I, I feel like there's more electrolytes flowing through me now than there was five minutes ago, but um, not impressed. Okay. You want to give us a rundown of chapter six before I jump in? Or should we just assume people are listening to all these back to back to back to back to back to back to back? To back? Um, I'm going to say that this is going to be our last episode for a while of this series, because I swear to God, if people have to listen to another episode of you ranting about this book, they're going to go insane. I'm going insane. Our, I... our five consistent listeners are going to go down to three consistent <laughs> listeners. <laughs> 
Oh, Lauren and I got some content planned. We'll do an Am I the Asshole or something. Uh, so, yeah, um, stay sane. There's other things coming. But also, don't you enjoy supporting your favorite podcast host and his obsessions? Maybe you enjoy it less now that you see him like up close and personal with this new video technology we have. Yeah. And he's like, yeah, no, I, I, I'm a little too close and personal with this guy. Am I right? What a, what a, what a dickweed. Uh, anyways, how about we jump back in, Naomi? Let's get to chapter six, part four, section bajillion, negotiating in bad faith. Much as men don't like to admit it, we have emotions. Men fall in love, are true romantics, and are much closer to unconditional love than women. Furthermore, men are conditioned to want women, families, and children by our evolutionary histories. So it is only natural that men want the old contract more than anything else. I'm not sure if this is on purpose or not, but he said before that men want sex more than anything else. So I'm not sure if he's like, the old contract is all about sex. It isn't about like raising kids and having a family. Or if he just forgot, I'm going to assume the latter. Um... Unfortunately, when you combine that with men's higher sex drives, it puts men in a compromised position when negotiating with women. Women know that you want sex more than they do. Women know you want them more than they do you. And this imbalance of power allows many of them to negotiate in bad faith. Negotiating in bad faith is a legal term that means bargaining with no intention of reaching an agreement. This is usually done to delay resolution to buy some time, put yourself in a better bargaining position, or give yourself some advantage in negotiations. But regardless of the underlying reason, it is always to hide an ulterior motive. And many women's ulterior motive is to get the two things they seek most out of men, attention and resources, by offering the old contract benefits of sex and a unicorn wife with the intention of delivering neither. These bad faith negotiations usually fall into four general categories. First, women use dating apps or social media solely to get attention. This is so obvious, I shouldn't have to explain it. But since most young people socialize online, this is the most common instance of women negotiating in bad faith. And while it might seem convenient or efficient to meet women online or through a dating app, it is quite the opposite, simply because so few women are there to date. Look at any Tinder analytics breakdown of a woman's dating app, and you'll find the general disinterest in men laid bare. But the two particular statistics you want to look at are A, the percentage of men they matched with that they chat with, the percentage of men that they matched with that they go on a date with. Though it would require access to all the... Oh, okay, I guess those are the two statistics. Um, though it would require access to all the dating apps, ch- date, all the dating apps databases, in general, you can expect only 20% of the women you match with to chat with you, while only about 5% of women will actually go on a date with you. And keep in mind, these are the girls you swiped with, which is usually less than 1% of the tens of thousands of profiles you swiped on. It's obvious that if they're only going out with 5% of the men they find physically attractive, they're not there to date. They're there for attention. It also helps to take a macro view of people's behaviors to see their true motives. For example, men and women spend about 90 minutes daily on dating apps. How are we feeling so far? Keep going, Joel. Keep sludging through this awful mud that we call a book. I like how he conflates dating apps and social media because I know practically all of the women that like I know in real life, not, you know, through the Internet, um, use apps like Instagram primarily to follow accounts with like cute dogs or travel ideas or easy cooking options for dining at home with your spouse. Right. Like. He he's conflating the two and he's like, ah, oh, women and use social media to, you know, post booty pics and, you know, get all sorts of positive reactions. But also a lot of people just use social media to like follow their interests and get a feed of curated content that appeals directly to them. Am I crazy? No, no one would do that ever. Oh, okay. So I am crazy. Great. Yeah. Um, he's throwing out a bunch of stats and I don't think he really has any basis in reality for them. I think he concedes he just kind of made them up. We've already talked a bit about how women select partners on dating apps and that a big driver of selection is that the total number of men are far higher than those of women on basically every app. I don't know where he jumps to the conclusion like that women are just on for attention and might argue men want exactly the same thing, especially if men think women are gold diggers and don't want to spend money on them until they prove themselves faithful. Um, The thing he cites about 90 minutes does seem to be based on actual research, but it's a study done by the dating app Badoo, right? 
Um, I don't know if the dating app Padu, which I had not heard of before, like this point of time, is reflective of the general stats of other dating apps. Uh, the other thing is, it's a study based upon their users, not random people everywhere. So like he says, the sentence Aaron uses is men and women spend about 90 minutes daily on dating apps, which implies that like all people averaged out yield this quantity. But that's just for people who are actively on dating apps trying to find partners. Um, it seems like 90 minutes a day is a lot of a time investment. If you actually want attention, you feel the easier option seems to be just like posting like a bikini pic on Instagram or Facebook or going and taking a pottery class or volunteering at like a, a pet's shelter, right? Like there's easier ways to get that if you're willing to dedicate 90 minutes a day. The real reason why Lauren is currently taking a pottery class is to meet people, to meet people to replace you, Joel. I, I think she's taking the pottery class to meet people, but not for the reasons you think. It's to learn how to make the biggest fucking bowl out of ceramic. She's describing how she's making larger and larger bowls, and I'm like, are we trying to take a bath in them? Good lord, the, the, they won't even fit through the door when you're done. It's for all of... It's for all of the olives. All the cats? All of the olives. Oh, that's a good point. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. For those who are listening who have no idea what we're talking about, uh, my partner Lauren... Um, is not a fan of olives, and our family, the, the Guy family, is very much a fan of olives, so she has made us a olive dish specifically to appeal to our weird-ass um, obsession olive with intake. olives. Yeah. And kind of, like, watches us with horrified expressions as we just, like, shovel garlic-stuffed green olives into our mouths at They're Thanksgiving. They're so good for no reason. They're so good for no reason. It is true. Uh, Naomi, I don't know if our listeners can hear this, but I'm like picking up like the sound of like suction and like someone scrubbing something in your background. Do you have any idea what that is? Um, it's probably the the work that is being done outside of my house right now with a with an air blower. I would love to control that, we, but we, I literally we, we have not. we have special effects in our studio this week, people. <laughs> Okay, uh, men have the obvious and honest intention of going on dates and getting laid. I, I, I feel that's fair. Would you say that's fair? Uh, sure. <laughs> um, I, I think it's accurate, but I don't know if men are open about that. They definitely want to get laid. That's definitely true. Yeah. Yeah. I had someone, this is actually really interesting. I had someone recently like message me on Hinge and be like, hey, so I think you're really like, you seem like a really cool person, but I'm looking for something super casual right now. And I texted him back and I was like, hey, like, I just, I'm not really interested in having like casual sex. Like I would like, I don't just, you know, not a whole. And um, so, you know, no harm, no foul. He just unfo like unmatched me. And that was the end of that. And it was super to the point. It was super like, it, it was good. We didn't waste any more time and, and we moved on. I feel that's like a pickup artist technique where it's like, oh, I didn't mean sex. I wanted like a friendship. How dare you think of me as just a piece of meat? Joel. I'm writing my own pickup artist book. Joel, I feel like not everything is a scheme to be a pickup artist. Mmm. I live in the real world, Naomi. Do you have that thing where you, like, intake media and then you, like, take on the personality of the person or the thing that is... Oh, God, no. Okay, because it's, it's and The fact you right even now. think about that is concerning to me. Oh, man. Uh, okay, so um, men have the obvious and honest intention of going on dates and getting laid. But when you do the math for women, that means women are spending between 10 and 30 hours on dating apps just to go on one date. I didn't bother checking his math. It's all made up numbers. It doesn't matter. With such a tremendous waste of time, there is no way that women are using dating apps for dating. Or again, like as we've discussed before, the quality is so low on dating apps that they don't feel they can easily find decent partners. Again, they're using them solely for attention. Sadly, this negotiation and bad faith is not without its price. Because while women are perfectly fine spending 90 minutes a day shooting attention into their veins, like their heroin addicts, yeah. uh, men are wasting 10% of their waking hours and 10% of their conscious lives on dating apps. Um, 10% of their waking hours and 10% of their conscious lives... I feel like he took this data from, like, a single person that he interacted with, like, a single woman that was like, oh, I only am on dating apps for, like, attention. And then he took that and just fucking ran with it. 
And he was like, every well, single think about woman. It. Like, like this is the reason I was like, it's important to distinguish between the average user of a dating app spending 90 minutes a day versus the average person in society spending 90 minutes a day. Yeah. Uh, because he says 90 minutes a day, 10% of their conscious lives. And I'm like, people don't date forever. The vast majority of people find a partner and like settle down in about five years of using dating apps. Right. So like, he doesn't really understand how stats work. He's like, Oh God, maybe this is his experience. Maybe you're right. He's like, I've been using dating apps for 30 years and I haven't found anybody. And I spend 90 minutes a day wasting my life. Oh, that's so depressing. He's telling on himself. You're saying it takes an average of five years on a dating app to find someone? Or did you just pull um, that out of your I, ass? I'm spit I'm spitballing. Oh, so you're becoming him. Yeah. Okay. I'm I'm going off my personal experience and trying to spread it as an anecdote that applies to everyone. Oh god, I am adopting his personality. Damn, you've really hit that nail on the head. Uh yeah, so great use of numbers. Uh, he's just saying shit because he knows there isn't way to pr- in any way to prove any of this. Like, you could also go out and ask women why they use dating apps and what they're looking for, but women are all liars, according to him, so it's just easier to make things up. Um, this used to be, like, a somewhat researched, really poorly done, but, like, somewhat researched paper, and now this is just, like, an incel screed. Maybe he learned a lot from the Adivisionary site. I don't know. Uh, He says there's so much more that men could do with this time. You could start a business. You could get an advanced degree. You could build a house, get a shredded body at the gym, or enjoy some leisure time. Here is a numerical price tag to measure this waste of time. If you worked that 90 minutes earning the median wage and invested it into an average returning mutual fund starting at 18, you'd have $3.6 million by retirement age. Women don't deserve your attention online. Is that true? Jeez, Naomi. Did you know you could build a house if you didn't spend 90 minutes a day on a dating app? Um, I'm going to say no because that's really expensive. Whoa, you just like like find some land and cut down some trees. Look, I spend a lot of time on Instagram and I see those Indian guys who are like, I'm in the middle of the rainforest and I'm going to build a sauna. Yeah, but like, at the same time, it's like, okay, you need to factor in, like, are you just going to like set a timer every single day and like 90 minutes on the dot, you're like, okay, got to go. Drop everything. Yeah, yeah. Okay. It's like going to the gym after work. You you go out to the middle of the Sonoran Desert because you live in Arizona and this hypothetical and you, you know, have your, your mining claim that you're slowly turning into a house and you, you know, have to get all your tools out of the back, and that burns like 15 minutes. You set up your band saw, and that takes five minutes. And you have to pull all the wood out from storage because you didn't want it to dry rot. And you start cutting pieces of wood, and you have a whole 10 minutes of labor. And it's like, oh, nine minutes nearly up. Time to pack up. And you pack up and get back in your truck and drive back to civilization. Yeah, it's, it's as easy as that. Uh, so I saw this, and I was like, he's kind of venturing into like LinkedIn self-help guru, where it's like... If only you tried harder, you would be successful. And I'm seeing a lot more of this on TikTok. Uh, well, no, I spend time on Twitter and I see TikTok videos reposted to Twitter, which are making fun of this. But it's people who are like, did you know you can become a millionaire with just $10 if you double your money in only like 50 trades? And it's like, that's okay, not really how the stock market just works. just pushing a capitalistic agenda. Like, this is nothing new. He's like, if you only worked harder, you'd be successful like me, and you'd pull all the bitches. I think that's true, but I think this is also betraying how much of his, like, perception of reality is shaped by social media, because he sees these things and is trying to ape that kind of mentality and, like, gumption ethos that is so popular online like these are the people he spends time watching and absorbing and learning from and so this is how he thinks the world works which is completely divorced from reality like i don't think doing stuff you like to do or that you find personally helpful is a bad thing i just think doing things out of spite is a bad idea i also think he's dramatically underselling how easy it is to do these things which i think betrays that some he's someone who like might have come from wealth and never really had to fight and scrap to survive so Naomi, on the topic of homes, homes are super easy to build, right? Totally. I've done it. Um, I, I gave up my, so- and... my social media and my dating apps and I built a home. Oh, that's where you're living in San Diego. That's so impressive. Yeah. 
I love what you've done with the place. Thanks. I think you could have chosen a different paint job besides like eggshell and cream, but um Joel, this is my home. You build your own home. Get off social media. Get look, off dating apps. Look look, Naomi, in only a week of ninety minute days, you could repaint your entire house a different color. I could, yeah. So I did the math here. Uh, U.S. Census Bureau uh, says that a home ta- can take seven to eight months to build. Uh, some sites say that if you're like working from a kit or like have a really basic design, it can take as low as three. Uh, that is, however, with trained builders who pour foundations correctly the first time and don't make mistakes that require rework and incur extra costs down the line. So let's say seven to eight months. Assuming a five-day work week, only four weeks in every month, it's super hot out, maybe just six hours a day, we get a total of 840 to 960 hours of labor needed to complete a building. And that's assuming that this is with one person, which is like wholly inaccurate. If you work eight-hour days to complete this, it would take 1,120 to 1,280 hours. Um, I think probably other people would contribute but like this is a really small house you'll only need to spend 853 90 minute sessions to complete it working 52 weeks a year 90 minutes a day it will take you three and a half years to complete your house from scratch naomi i don't see the issue yeah because that's you know three and a half years that like you're not dating women which is you know super easy and convenient and this will have absolutely no repercussions on your day-to-day life yeah um yeah, again, this is a little unachievable. Um, assuming that the U.S. Census Bureau is wrong and only takes three months to build a house, it's 320 work sessions or 1.31 years, but I'm pretty sure you're not getting a mansion for that. Keep in mind, too, that the cheapest model homes I could find were seventy to $110,000, and that's for basically a trailer. Um, if you want something that's a bit better than that, you're probably paying two hundred and fifty dollars to $400. Well, Unrelated, can you hear a cat screaming outside my door? I can. Okay. Um, should I figure out what's going on with them? No, I think you should let it happen because they're little kittens and the audience will understand. But then they're going to think we're mean and cruel for not paying attention to the little fosters. No, they won't. Is it like annoying? No, Is it, like, it's just like cute little like, Okay, yes. okay. <laughs> That's that's pretty cute. They sound a lot more desperate, like I haven't fed them. And I have fed them today. I want that on the record. I gave them the good $44 a bag food from Fry's because they won't eat anything else. Yeah, because they're spoiled. I'm, I'm a good father. I ignore my children, but at least I feed them. <laughs> yeah, so what about the money you make? Um, he says if you work 90 minutes a day earning the median wage and invested into an average returning mutual fund starting at 18, you'd have $3.6 million by retirement age. Um, I looked at the Motley Fool. Naomi, how much do you think the median salary is in the United States? 65. Ooh, very close. Uh, you know, you're right in the ballpark. It's $61,000 a year, about $29 okay. an hour. Um, most 18 year olds aren't making that. No shit. Most 18 year olds don't have an opportunity to make that. A lot of people in their 20s aren't making that. Yeah. Um, so again, this is someone who's kind of divorced from the world who might have had a leg up with wealthy parents or influence of some kind and thinks that everyone can achieve this if they just like put their mind to it. Um, so if you're making this at age 18, you're ahead of the game you're doing great if you are you're also probably salaried and if that were the case you would not have a lot of overtime hours but eh, whatever if you were working 90 minutes a day on overtime you would make an extra 43 dollars and 50 cents per day awesome yeah i think i calculated for the week it's 188 dollars and 50 cents for a year it's 2200 dollars and 60 cents um, that's working 52 weeks a year because taking vacation is for women, not strong, hard, real men. Um, I took that, I took that amount of money you're making each year, starting at age 18. I plugged it into an investment calculator, principal of 2200 weekly ad of, uh, $188 and 50 cents. I gave him the benefit of the doubt and found a great interest rate of 10%. And I looked at a 30 year period. So you're at retirement age, you've worked 30 years, you're 48, you go to the bank to take it out. How much do you have, Naomi? $410,000. That won't even get you a house. 
Yeah, um, I don't know where his math went wrong, unless he thinks retirement age is a bit older, because, yeah, we're not at $3 million like he promised, working 90 minutes a day overtime. Um, if, if you retire significantly later, at age 65, actually, you get $820,000. If you assume 12% interest and the age 65 retirement, you get $1.4 million. If you retire at age 73 at 12% interest, you actually do get $3.4 million. But that's like assuming you haven't stopped your contributions due to like problems in the market. That's assuming that you can somehow maintain this insanely high interest rate that very few people have. Um, that's assuming that like you're still alive at age 73, which isn't guaranteed. Speaking of that, the average male lives to be how old, Naomi? We discussed this last episode with regards to New Zealand. 71? 72. Mm, 78. 78, okay. 78. Women are closer to about 82, 83, and that's pretty true around the world. In the United States, it's dropping, though, so that's not guaranteed if you live over here and are earning all this money. Um, so if you retire at age 73, you get that $3.4 million he promised, but you'll only have about five years to enjoy it. Um, like, I totally get that there's other factors here. It's very likely you're going to get a pay raise at some point in this period, but he's, like, actively lying to his readers about how easy this is and ignoring things like risks of climate change to investment returns or just the possibility your landlord raises your rent and sucks up that $2,200 a year entirely after only a couple of years. So, again, this is someone who's like, you could be a better person and it's super easy if you just applied yourself. And then you look at the actual numbers and you're like... No, bud. And the fact you think this way indicates to me you don't really get how society works. So maybe you're not the person to be writing a self-help book for men. I don't know. What gave it away? <laughs> he goes on. The second way, recall there's four separate ways that women negotiate in bad faith. The second way women negotiate is by using dating for attention and resources. Like online dating, there is an implied contract in actual dating that you are physically attracted to one another and that there is a prospect of a relationship forming later. And so you go through the courtship ritual of dating so the girl is comfortable enough with you to have sex and potentially become your future wife. But this process is fraught with opportunities for a woman with ulterior motives to take advantage of this implied contract. Um, speaking just from a legal sense, um, that's not how contracts are formed. <laughs> Like, just because someone messages you and you go on a date does not mean you have a contract. I think he should think about this in kind of the opposite scenario from the perspective of a man. Like, if a man shows up to a date and he's well-intentioned and he really wants to, like, make a woman comfortable and get her comfortable enough to have sex and then settle down with her as a wife, but he shows up and she's less attractive, like she's, like, 20 pounds heavier than she was in the profile photos, like, he's not under a contract to go through the motions and meet with her for coffee and then treat her to dinner and then have sex and then get married and then pump out kids. Like the simple fact someone meets you for a date does not mean that you are obligated to marry them down the line. That's such a ridiculous way to think about dating. But again, this is how Aaron portrays the process. Is this how you think about dating, Naomi? Yeah, I do. Every single day. Every day you go on. Yeah, I have a lot, I have a lot of husbands. Did they help you build the house, I hope? Nah, I'm an independent woman. Damn. Yeah. Okay, can they at least help you repaint? Stop! It's a, it's a fun <laughs> color! So this can be as petty as a girl that's just leading you on, agreeing to go on a date with you, only to flake or stand you up at the last minute for kicks. It could be passing a note to you in class to lead you on so she can get attention and make fun of you in school, like what happened to Tom. Do you remember what happened to Tom? I feel like this guy just has a lot of trauma that he has not talked <laughs> through. Like, he was rejected by every single girl in high school, and now it's just coming out in this book. Yeah, we will talk about that. I don't know how many episodes in the future, but I dug into one of his other books and I was like, oh, this dude has issues because the way he describes his dating life in his 20s is um, not great. And the fact he doesn't see anything wrong with it is concerning. Uh, Tom was the guy he gave an example of, I think in either chapter two or three, he said Tom, Dick and Harry, yeah. you know, the three examples of men who were just exploited by evil women. And Tom was the kid who was like, uh, I'm a high schooler and I like this girl and I asked her out and then she made fun of me and now I'm a social pariah. 
And uh, that was that was the definitely real example that happens all the time. You, you you see it everywhere on the internet. Just just evil women being evil. That's what happens. Mm-hmm. It could be because she's bored and doesn't want to stay at home. So she goes out with you, but not because she likes you. She's just bored. She could potentially like you, but you're her insurance policy if her primary guy bails on her and you're just in a holding pattern. Or she could be cold and just looking for a free meal or entertainment. Many have women have many other reasons to date men beyond sex and relationships. So do men. Um, I think he's ignoring the phenomenon of like men who want a trophy girlfriend they can bring to like work and brag about like men who want someone they can take with them to like a family get together to show they're not like single and weird or like a high school reunion to show off and be like, look how successful I am. Look at my pretty girlfriend. Um, I think there's also men who like want someone to make their ex jealous or they might just want company because they're lonely because that's a real emotion that men also experience. Like he's trying to paint women as like uniquely evil and devious and scheming. And it's like, no, lots of people, both genders, all genders will date for a variety of reasons. A lot of them are looking for romance, but that's not true. And frankly, a lot of people are pretty upfront, as you said, about what they're looking for and they're not looking for that. So, again, bad traumatic dating experiences, and thus we have to generalize an entire sex. Naturally, not every girl you date is there to feed off of your attention or the free mail you bought her. Oh, good, he is providing exceptions. But if you're not savvy, you will waste an incredible amount of time and resources dating women who just aren't that into you. I keep saying women, and he actually writes girls, and I feel weird saying that because I'm picturing like just a 12-year-old schoolgirl, and I really hope that's not what he's talking about. Or he's doing that thing that like men do where they're like, I don't call women women because they don't deserve it i'm gonna call call them them, girls i call them females yeah so he says that like uh, not every girl is bad but there are some bad ones out there and i'm reminded of trump's comment where he's like the immigrants are coming across our borders to like rape our women and steal our jobs and i guess some of them are okay you know like it's, 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 it, we, we can't tell, though, so we should just, you know, build a giant wall with, like, machine guns on our border. Maybe that's a solution to the dating crisis. Yeah, that's the only solution. I want to step back for a second, because he's just thrown a lot of shit at us, and I want to discuss, like, what the shit he said was. And it basically boils down to, not every person is going to be interested in a relationship with you. I don't think that's horrible dating advice but how he's packaging it certainly is um i think it's useful to understand that like you're going to encounter a lot of people who like maybe have different opinions and beliefs and thoughts about the world and the state of relationships than you and you're gonna have to live with that um i'm reminded a little bit of um something like fight club have you seen fight club Mm mm-hmm Fight Club is a movie about, like, the crisis of modern masculinity, and it has, you know, the main character and his sidekick creating a cult that, like, draws in men who feel, like, isolated and lonely. And the thing that I I, I realized while watching Fight Club is if you want to have an effective cult, if you want to, like, lure people in, you can't just give completely batshit crazy advice. You have to have, like, some kernels of good advice at the core. Right. You have to provide something of substance to people so that they're willing to be like, oh, this person has like some good ideas. And then they're more likely to listen to you moving forward. And I feel that's kind of what like Aaron's doing here. He's like, some women are bad. okay? but he's going to use that to build upon and create this like framework of like some subset of some women sometimes are mean. Therefore, men should completely separate themselves from interacting with women. And you can see how like that little kernel of like potential truth spirals out of control. Um, I I think one good example of this in like the right is someone like Jordan Peterson. Um, Jordan Peterson is a famed psychopath slash analyst whose full-time job is talking about how like much women suck and how they shouldn't be allowed in workplaces. Um, He also thinks and has talked about at length how men should get women assigned to them as like sex partners in order to keep society functioning. Um, The thing is, Jordan Peterson does not talk about that when you read his books. He gives books of advice like the 12 rules of life. And the 12 rules of life are things like stand up straight with your shoulders back. Make friends with people who want the best for you. 
tell the truth or at least don't lie be precise in your speech and it's like stuff that may be helpful for some people and is like generally good advice but then he uses that framework after having drawn people in to be like and this is why women wear makeup in order to seduce men and you should always be suspicious of women in makeup I know I am. Yeah, I am too. Because, like, clowns wear makeup, and clowns are always evil, so... Women equal clowns. What are women scheming? Equal evil. I I feel there is a stand-up bit about, like, women doing pratfalls and seltzer water and spinning bow ties. Anyways, uh, moving on. (laughs) So the point I'm trying to make is Aaron is throwing out the first of what will be this like long string of like thoughts and beliefs about the world. And you can sort of see how it escalates. And I just wanted to start here and be like, it's interesting because if you look at the core of his advice, it's not horrendous, but it's just going to get worse and worse. And he's going to keep referring back to that core idea that some women sometimes have made me feel bad. And that's going to be the impetus for like the rest of this. Um, Current Affairs also, by the way, has done this piece about Jordan Peterson that's very good. It points out that like half of what he says is meaningless gobbledygook. Um, Half of it is overly simplistic analyses of the world. And the third half is talking about how like the philosophy of transgenderism is what inspired the Holocaust. Um, In order to bring people in, I guess I'm trying to say you have to have good advice from the get and then layer on the crazy shit later. That's exactly what we're going to be seeing. So here's a couple of rules that Aaron has for like how to conduct yourself in the wild, crazy world of dating. First, Naomi, you have to expect at least half the time the girl will flake or cancel at the last minute. This ensures you have plans. You don't waste a precious Friday night off or pass up on an extra shift where you can earn extra money. What do we think? You ever been stood up on a date, Naomi? I think it's, okay, I think it's stupid that you, like, say this shit. Because, like, to me, you anyone has any right to stand somebody up. Like, not in a mean way. Just be like, hey, like, I got, you know, something else going on. My, my mom is in the hospital or something like that. I don't think that that's the end-all be-all of why you should, that this is not a villain origin story. <laughs> it is for him. Apparently. <laughs> Yeah, this he was stood up once. No, he went on two dates. One was one where a girl stood him up, and he was like, 50% of the time, women don't show up. Um, I'm going to assume, we, we've talked about some stats about like people being stood up before, and I think the stat we pulled was that um, men and women flake at approximately the same rates. I, I am interested. Have you ever been flaked on by uh, a man? Not like in person. Like I haven't gone to the date. Like I'm the type of person where I like, I need it confirmed before I like at least mm-hmm. 24 hours in advance before I go. Um, at least, but like I've had people cancel on me last minute, but I haven't had anything to the point where like I show up and they are, they just don't show up. Yeah. 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 I mean, I've been flaked on, I think once, and I've gone out on, you know, dozens of dates. I had one person call me before a date and was like, Hey, my mom's in the hospital and then never heard from them again. Um, I that didn't really happen. Oh yeah. That happened uh, sophomore year of college. And I like approached, uh, uh, I approached one of my roommates at times like, um, do you think this girl likes me? Cause like now she won't respond to my calls. I'm, I don't know. Is, do you think it's okay? And he's like, move on with your life. And I'm like, that's probably good advice. <laughs> Um, yeah, I don't think this is horrible advice. I would say probably check to make sure the time works before scheduling things solidly or let the other party set the date and then they're more invested and it shows that they're interested. Or don't get so invested that you become a villain in the process. Like, I don't understand why it's such a big deal. Like somebody's not interested in you. They didn't show up. Okay, move on with your life. But Naomi, you could be making 90, do- 90 minutes worth of money. That's $43. Okay, Naomi. okay, let's move I mean, that's $2,200 over on. the course of a 52-week work week year. Uh, okay, two, FaceTime with a girl to make sure she looks like how she presents herself online. Also find out if she's got kids or any other deal breakers she conveniently forgot to mention. I'm not going to comment on that one. We can move on. That's pretty self-explanatory. 
I find this funny because um, we talked about the beginning of the year changes in dating trends in 2023. Yeah. And a big one was that more and more people are going on video dates before they meet in person, just like quick, like meet and greets of like five, 10 minutes yeah. to touch base and see you know, if the person is their type. I think women are actually more in favor of this than men are. Um, I would say a lot of women are like super open about being like, oh, is this man going to murder me? I'm going to like do a simple, you know, vibe check and see if that's a likelihood before I go on a date with him. So like he's pushing this. I don't think this is the worst thing in the world. I think the motivations are a bit whack. Um, I think, yeah, if people are being dishonest with you online. Potentially that's a red flag for the whole relationship. But like this whole idea that all women are devious and therefore you have to like do a background check on them before you meet them in person and spend money on a $5 coffee is maybe a bit far. Um, three, keep first date simple, short, and cheap. Coffee dates or cocktails are perfectly fine and keep them within walking distance of your place so you're not wasting time commuting to a date who is going to ghost to you. Um... I don't know. I think women might be a little skeeved out if a guy's like, can we meet just down the street yeah. from my house? Yeah, because it's I know like, this great bar on the ground floor of my apartment. No, I don't like that because it's like, obviously that to me, if someone were to say that to me, I would have been like, oh, okay, like you're just trying to get me into your apartment. But the second thing is like, you're just lazy. Like you're not wanting to go and like get like the best cocktail or the best coffee. You're looking someplace convenient. Like, I'm not saying yeah. you need to get me the best cocktail or the best coffee, but it's like, put some thought into said date. I'm confused, too, because he's like, oh, you want to do something cheap so women can't exploit you. Has he seen the price of cocktails recently? Cocktails Insane. expensive. Insane. Like, I don't go out drinking that much. When Lauren and I do go to, like, a bar, it's like a really fancy schmancy place that, you know, puts some thought and time and energy into the drinks. And yeah, you're looking at, like, $18 per drink. I'm not saying all places are like that, but, you know, I went uh, with my father yesterday to go see a, a live performance of The Dollop, and we were at a bar with a two-drink minimum in the showroom, and those drinks were like $10, $12 for a Red Bull and, like, some blue carousel mixed together. It was it was crazy. Just out of curiosity, what did Dad drink? Uh, our father had two kilt lifters. <laughs> he said it was the beer of kings. I had to take his word for it. Not a beer guy. Yeah. Uh, fourth, no one to quit. The vast majority of your dates will not lead to anything. This is because, for whatever reason, she is not that into you. It could be another guy. It could be she never liked you. It could be any one of those reasons, and it doesn't matter why. All that matters is what is. I think that's fair. Dating is frustrating. It takes time to find a partner. People can sometimes be happier getting back on the market than continuing a miserable, you know, partial kind of not really relationship. I don't know. I think it's good telling men, hey, don't like stalk women obsessively if they don't want to go out with you anymore. Mm, good advice. Yeah. In short, when it comes to dating, women deserve less. He finally said it. Oh, my God. <laughs> well, OK, yeah, it is like in the films where they're like. Ah, and this is our Independence Day. And you're like, that's the name of the movie. The movie's named Independence Day. That's why it's called it. Um, yeah, uh, remember how I said that, like, he would take basic principles and then spiral them out of control? Yeah. He's like, don't get emotionally invested in women. Don't spend money on people on the first couple of dates. And he's like, and that is why as a society we should strip women of their earthly possessions and put them in jail. This is just such a weird escalation. I'm like, were women asking for more? I wonder if this is, again, like, the people that he follows on social media and possibly hangs out with. Because, like, you look at a Myron Gaines episode of his Fresh and Fit podcast, and he's bringing on, like, OnlyFans models. And it's very likely that, like, if you're going on a date with someone whose, like, entire image or entire focus is like having a good image online they want to go to luxury steakhouses they want to get you know expensive meals and take lots of photos showing off you know where they were who they were with um i don't think that's true for most people um i think it's true for a subset of people and the fact you think it applies to most people again is more indicative of the sort of people you like spend time following and like looking at online um I've been on a lot of first dates in my life. I have never gone on a first date with anyone like this. I don't know about you, Naomi, but the most I have ever spent on a date was probably $60. These are like first dates. I was more on that with Lauren. Um, and I think my date even offered to split the check there. 
like unless you can prove this is a super common phenomenon it just seems like a way to just arbitrarily hate women it's a picture of women that doesn't seem to match up with most people's lived experiences but the problem is if someone younger than dating age is reading this they haven't had these experiences they can't scratch their head and go that doesn't match my reality so they're going to start dating with a chip on their shoulder they're going to go into dating and be like hugely skeptical of money grubbing e-girls everywhere they go and that's really the concerning part. This isn't bad for like people who are like reading this who are kind of skeptical who already have dating experience. It's bad for all the people without dating experience who are internalizing these lessons. Okay. You with me? Yeah. <laughs> and he's like, no, it's good, Joel. I'm going to fight you on this. Good cop, bad cop. That's how our show's always been. I'm pretty sure I'm the bad cop because I'm the one who reads all the like evil cop literature yeah yeah uh yeah so he says limit the time money and energy you invest in a girl until she proves she's actually into you and not using you the third thing that women do remember we have four things we're looking at with regards to women you know negotiating in bad faith is digital relationships with the advent of the internet an increasing percentage of people's social and love lives have moved online of course, there's nothing wrong with this per se, as the internet can be used to meet people and even be a great tool to vet someone. But with an increasing percentage of people living their lives online, an increasing percentage of men are settling for digital relationships instead of real ones in the real world. This gives women negotiating in bad faith a tremendous opportunity to profit from these men. At minimum, you are all too familiar with the attention whore who posts selfies on social media solely to get praise and admiration from her male followers, who are permanently friend-zoned but never allowed to DM her. I didn't put this in the outline, but like speaking of attention whores, have you seen what Andrew Tate posts? It's like all photos of him shirtless with muscle cars. Like, yeah. he is always looking for compliments from men. He is constantly looking for attention online. That is like his whole shtick. Also, he's like, anyone know any people who can be trafficked? I'm looking for some people to traffic. Hit me up if you want to be trafficked. Oh! Uh, yeah. Many women do the same on social media, but then redirect you to their webcam account or PayPal to get money in addition to attention. Some directly monetize their sexuality by selling nudes or feet pics to any simp who gives her money. Worse, they can morph into the girlfriend experience where e-thoughts boyfriends text you behind the scene to make you think you have a special one-on-one -on -one relationship with her. And even worse than that is the increasing trend of online-only relationships where men and women never meet but are exclusively dating online. Women love these types of relationships because they get everything they need out of men with no actual physical commitment. Furthermore, they can have as many digital boyfriends as possible since the internet is scalable. But regardless of what kind of digital relationship you have with these girls, they're all a waste of time, as you will never meet them in the real world. People like to point out that OnlyFans made $4.8 billion off of Simps in 2021, but this pales in comparison to the trillions of hours billions of men waste worshipping girls online every year. Had men invested that time into themselves working or doing something of value, we're talking tens of trillions of dollars in lost opportunities every year. Opportunities that could drastically improve men's lives across the globe. Again, women deserve less. I think Except it's, he did. I think it's interesting that he keeps saying like, oh, like w men should be like working instead of like dating women. But it's like the entire time <laughs> he's like, oh, well, we should be married and like babies and, and children and, and wife and kids and, you know, marriage and all these things. And I'm just like very confused. Like, does he want you to work or like, does he want you to like, I guess he does kind of explain it where he's like, oh, well, you should get married on the first date. And uh, I think, and I don't think this is articulated, but I believe it's the implication. It's the only thing that really makes sense. He's saying the world used to be governed by the old contract where men used to work to support a family. And now that we're in this new, like crazy new contract world, don't worry about having a family at all. Like, because you can never, like, get the better end of, like, the arrangement because women are always going to exploit you, just give up on that. Like, that's an unrealistic dream. Just just drop it completely. Go and pursue your, 
workout regime at the gym, go and ride a motorcycle across the desert, go do some cool stuff as a man, man. And, um, yeah, I think he's like, there's no way to get the old contract back. There is no way to be a heterosexual man marrying a woman, having two kids in this society, Naomi. I believe you. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, um, this man loves his hyperbole, does he not? Saying tens of trillions of dollars are wasted with people watching e-girls every year. Would you agree, Naomi? I do agree. Oh God, I'm I'm gonna have a problem with you. <laughs> um, once again, I have done the math here. The global economy was saying that the total amount of value generated in GDP was 86 trillion dollars last year. If he's saying tens of trillions, that implies at least 20 trillion dollars of value is lost almost one quarter of the entire global economy because men spend so much time watching porn on the internet. He is saying that the economy would expand by 25% overnight if men got off the internet. This would be the biggest make-work project in global history if the government just shut off the internet. See, I'm genuinely curious. Like, you know those, you, you know those states that... Um they Pornhub shut off access to I'm wondering like what their economy is going to look like now I'm running for president in 2024 (laughs) I'm going to bring in the Christian right I'm going to bring in like moderates who want a better economy the way I'm going to do this is by promoting the porn make work initiative yeah we're going to shut off all the servers and the economy will just jump ahead like a like a bullet from a gun it's going to be incredible um, so OnlyFans claims that they get 3.85 billion visits a year. That's not visitors. That's Separate visits. visits. Okay. So that's 385 people visiting 10 times a year. Um, that's 38.5 visiting 100 times, 10.5 million visiting once daily, etc. The average visit is 5.15 minutes, which might be a fascinating data point for researchers in the field of orgasms. He says that men are wasting time they could be spending working overtime on projects. And so I say that's about $45 an hour, given that the median salary of people in the United States is $29. Okay. Uh, That's far higher than what, like, international visitors are probably making on missed overtime assignments. But, like, I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt here. Um, So if I take... $45 $45 an hour and multiply it by all the hours that are spent on OnlyFans each year, I get $15 billion. That's how much is effectively lost in productivity or money going to men when they could have been maximizing their returns and going to work more. That's not $20 trillion. It's a little bit different. But, like, I want to underline that, like, the fact his math is so bad is indicative both of this being an incredibly shoddy product but also that like maybe his perceptions and views on reality and all parts of this tech shouldn't be trusted. Cause if he fails just like basic math in sections where he's trying to make these like bold arguments about all of society, maybe he's failing basic math and logic in the other sections where he's making more insidious, but less obviously bad claims food for thought. Okay. Um, also, Naomi, I just want to stand up for masturbating. I want to stand up for orgasms. I want to stand up and be bold here. I think supporting sex workers is cool, goddammit. Um, I do think it's helpful advice to be like, yeah, don't have parasocial relationships with sex workers. Like, they're probably friends with you to make money, not because they genuinely, you know, want to have a relationship with you. But also, it's like, If it brings you value in your life because you're lonely and you want someone to spend time with, don't don't crap all over this. Right. If people are deriving pleasure and value from something, who are you to be like your desires and like beliefs and wants are completely stupid? Um, it, it, It seems like he just wants to tell men that what they do is bad and they should feel bad. And the reason they suffer is because they don't have any self control. Um, the reason they suffer might be because they are constantly trying to balance like 
what they want with what all the male influencers and role models are telling them they should want. Um, Finding content that's tailor-made to your interests on a site like OnlyFans probably saves a lot more man hours for society than like clicking around on porn sites trying to find something you find appealing. Like, if the average person spends five minutes on OnlyFans, (laughs) that tells me that they're probably done with their, like, orgasm and moving on with their day which seems a lot more productive than just like randomly scrolling through internet porn so like he's trying to shit on people for not being productive but i might argue only fans might be the most productive way to like go about your business get your rocks off get back to being a productive member of society so this guy's just being a jag um for men who are listening to this i think there's a better takeaway than what he's saying Having a libido is fine. Having an outlet for your libido is fine. I don't think you should listen to anyone who tells you you're a lesser person for doing these things. If you want an actually decent book recommendation, I would check out and strongly recommend Nikos Kazantzakis' Modern Odyssey. It's a sequel to The Odyssey, where Odysseus travels around the ancient world, reflecting upon existence and debating his philosophy with other major characters from religious traditions. At one point in the text, he meets someone who's effectively Jesus and talks with him about life for a while, noting that Jesus loves men's souls but despises their bodies. Um, For those who are unfamiliar with Christianity, our mortal shells are tainted by original sin, and so we have to spend our entire lives making up for it. Only by leading a good life can we escape our fleshly prison and rise into heaven where we can sit by God's side for all eternity and bask in his like warm glow or whatever. But in response to this, Odysseus is like, I think it's stupid to value people only for like their soul. This like incorporeal thing that you can't really measure or ever see. I value people for both their bodies and their souls, for their base passions just as much as their like higher instincts. Odysseus here is like blending together this philosophy of radical self-love, even with this like belief that you can aspire to be something greater. And that's like a recurring theme throughout the text, because like Kazantzakis portrays Odysseus as this like horn dog. He's this dude in his 60s who's like been, you know, a far better, more attractive, more interesting person in the past and is constantly like going around trying to find maidens to sleep with. And he's like someone who enjoys like feasting on like roast meat and like indulging in his baser passions for violence. But he's also like, look, those are the things that make me a person. Those are the things that define me. Those are the things that bring me pleasure in this world that's so filled with things of misery and suffering. And so it's really, really important for me to both, like, aspire to be a better better person, like, improve my soul, do moral and ethical things, while also respecting the fact that, like, as a person, I have wants and desires and needs. And I read that a few years ago, and I was like, that is such a better philosophy. That is so good. I love it. It's so wonderful. And I think men who are reading this should maybe not, you know, embrace exactly that, but think about that as an ethos. Like, you don't have to be ashamed for, like, having sexuality. You don't have to be ashamed for wanting things in life. You can just be a person and fight every day for incremental improvement. That's totally fine and valid. We're not here to shame you like your right-wing idols are. Period. Masturbation is fun. That's going to get clipped out of context. Yep. <laughs> yeah. That, oh man, we should we should see for our listeners. We're using this new app called Riverside, and apparently they take the videos of our recordings and like use AI quantum mechanics something to like pull out the best clips. And so I'm excited to have like the best clips be like masturbation is fun, and you know me looking like just absolutely wretched like a homeless guy because I haven't showered and my hair's all everywhere and I'm all sweaty because it's hot in my house. It's great. It's because you had to escape room without having knowledge that it was an escape room today. That's true. I did get I did get locked in an escape room. Naomi, I'm gonna do you a solid, and I think that is a good point to break off this episode. We have discussed so many things. We're not much closer to finishing chapter six, but you know what? It's it's the journey that matters more than the destination, right? I got so frustrated while while doing this episode today that I just like took out a pen and paper. It was very early on in the episode and I just started doodling. So if you want to see our <laughs> my live doodles that I was just showing the camera, subscribe to our Patreon, guys. 
I would say take a photo of that and upload it to our Patreon. Yeah. That'll be like the special bonus. Feature. And if you get it tattooed, we will send you um, a holiday card. If you change your name to date these guys, we will give you unlimited early access. Wait, didn't Subway do that recently? Yeah. Okay. I thought that was something It was like Okay, so th- the competition is if you change your name to Subway, Subway will give you unlimited sandwiches for life. I dug into the details and the details are like if you promise to change your name to Subway, Subway will enter you into a drawing to guarantee you sandwiches for life. And apparently 10,000 people have already like logged in and filled out a form that's like, I will change my name to Subway. I didn't know so many people still went to Subway. Like the idea of Subway is much better than actual Subway I have found. I don't think I've been in a Subway since like freshman year of college. And that was only because I had like ASU meal points I had to use up. And it was one of the few places that like would accept them on campus. The last time I Um, had a Subway sandwich was in the Oakland airport in February of this year, because that was the only thing that was open during my 6 p.m. flight on a Sunday. It was so weird. Well, listeners, we hope you have a great rest of your week. We hope we did not um, depress you. Um, more than the world already this was has. A, this was a pretty positive episode. Um, Joel- I want to throw something in. I shill our Patreon all the time. I'm going to do it immediately after like our theme music plays because I have that pre-recorded thing I attach at the end of each episode. Um, I did want to say, I get it. A lot of people don't have money to spare. I get it. You don't want to go through the hassle of having to sign up for a Patreon. Totally understand that, despite all of our many amazing perks that are exclusive to our Patreon users. Um, I will say this. If you want to support us, but don't have money to throw our way, please consider leaving a review and a comment on one of the many podcast platforms that we're on. Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Podcast Podcasts, you know, all the basic platforms. Um I've already forgot. I don't know any other podcast platforms. That's it. But yeah, if you like our work, we would greatly appreciate it. If you could leave us a preferably high review, uh, let us know what you like, dislike, uh, tell Naomi to stop doodling during our, uh, no, I was looking at our reviews on tell Joel to get a new book. Yeah. I I do that Um, every single week, but yes, uh, we, we like doing this. We like getting feedback so we can do content that people actually want to listen to. Um, yeah. Please throw a review our way. Um, we love you. We appreciate you. We hope that um, you win that big lottery that's coming up. Oh, is there a big lottery coming up? It's like $1.5 billion, Naomi. You haven't heard? No, but I know where I'm going immediately after this podcast ends. <laughs> the gas yeah, station. So, uh, best to of luck. Lottery ticket. Best of luck. Um. This is probably going to come out after that prize drawing occurs, but um, if you did win, please give us credit and maybe send us a Patreon donation. We love you. We do love you. Ta-ta for now. We have many thanks for the use of our theme music, which is the song Drop by Ketza. You can find more of their music online at ketza.uk. You can also find Date These Guys online on Twitter and Instagram at at datetheseguys or visit datetheseguys.org. If you have questions for the podcast or want to be a wealthy sugar parent, please send an email to datetheseguys at gmail.com. If you'd like to support our work, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash date these guys. We have behind the scenes information, early episode access, participation in polls, and exclusive access to a guy's sibling map of date ideas for the Arizona area. Since the world sucks right now, we are currently donating all Patreon proceeds to trans organizations like Trevor Project, a trans suicide prevention organization, and moving assistance funds for those fleeing states outlawing their very existence. Please consider becoming a member and supporting our work today.